sit in for her. And I'd like to call to order the Board of Regents Finance, Capital, and Resource Committee meeting. Uh, and we're in a public session. And I'd like to ask staff to confirm that we have a quorum. Good. Today, we're going to talk about the component unit affiliates, uh, a design school capital issue, uh, intangible property acquisition, uh, along with seven capital items and a couple of administrative things. Um, items four and five, as which were mentioned earlier, will be skipped today and will be emphasized significantly at the board meeting two weeks up in Flagstaff. So please remember that only members of the board um, or of the committee are allowed to vote on these uh, proposals that we put in front of you. <clears throat> Our first order of business is to approve the consent agenda, which is items 12 through 14. Does anybody have a conflict with those items? Seeing none, uh, I move that the committee approve items 12 through 14 listed mm -hmm. as the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, no, we're um, passed. Um, now we move to the approval of minutes, which is item number one in the prepared materials. Are there any questions or comments in regard to the minutes? Seeing none, I move that the committee approve the public session minutes from the March 23rd, 2023 Finance, Capital and Resource Committee meeting. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Good, passed. Yes. Item two. Uh, will be a discussion of the component affiliate reports for the three universities, and we'll ask each university to present their report. We're going to start um, uh, with Brad as an overview first before we get into the individual uh, universities. Brad? Thank you, Regent Herbold, Regents. Uh, today, I'm here to provide a brief overview of ABOR's policies related to the oversight of university relationships with a component unit affiliates. I'll explain some of these key ideas just so that we're all on the same page as we move into the university's presentations. First, let's understand what we mean by component unit affiliates. These are independent entities that are separate from the universities themselves, but exist to further the mission of the universities in the community. While there may be a broader system, uh, ecosystem of affiliates, in order to qualify as a component unit of the university, the organization needs to have a solid financial or governance connection with the university as defined by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board or CASB. So ABOR's policy recognizes the importance of these relationships in supporting the success of the universities and acknowledges that ABOR does not govern these organizations, but due to ABOR's oversight and fiduciary responsibilities for the universities, we have a uh, a need to oversee the relationships with these affiliates. So one day, way that the board has done that is by adopting a policy that has a set of requirements about the agreements that are put in place between the universities and the affiliated organizations. These agreements, for example, must acknowledge the separate and independent nature of the universities and the entities themselves. And the affiliates have to ensure that they do not represent themselves as operating on behalf of the university directly. Uh, the, they also need to take steps to ensure that their separate legal status is well communicated and maintained. In order to ensure proper oversight, each university must adopt policies about the relationships for establishing and overseeing its component unit affiliates, including requirements that the affiliates have an annual budget process, that have an independent audit annually, and they comply with relevant board and university policies. Uh, each university has to designate a senior official responsible for reviewing these agreements, to monitor risks and to maintain documentation. The universities periodically review these relationships with the affiliates to ensure that their agreements meet the need to comply with board's policies and applicable laws. And each university needs to provide an annual report to the board, which we are discussing today, related to the status of those affiliated entities uh, in its universe. 
Uh, with that having been laid out, I would like to invite Lisa Rolney from the University of Arizona to come forward with her team in order to provide an overview of the University of Arizona's affiliated component units. Brad, thank you, Regent Herbold. Uh, I know that we have limited time and you have lots of information in your packets. Um, so what I'd like to do is spend a, a couple minutes talking about uh, what's unique about our seven affiliate entities. Uh, all of them have distinct missions and all of their agreements are reviewed through our internal audit process. So let's jump in. All right. The foundation is uh, an entity that you've heard a lot about. Um, some of you have seen presentations by CEO and President J.P. Rosniak. Uh, it was established in 1958 uh, to support U of A by building relationships, securing philanthropic support, and managing and stewarding assets. Uh, we have senior leaders who serve on the foundation's board and committees. The CEO of the foundation is a member of our senior leadership team. Our development officers are embedded throughout our university, and our business officers interact with the foundation's finance system for reimbursements and disbursements of funds. We provide financial support for development services, operations, and endowment management through the Development Services and Asset Management Agreement. And uh, the University of Arizona Foundation's employees have an opportunity to uh, participate in our Qualified Tuition Reduction and Educational Assistance Program which we call QTR for short. Uh, we provide rent, utilities, and parking associated with the facility that the foundation is housed in, and they have use of our licensed trademarks. Uh, they provide us significant financial support for operations, which is integral to our emerging and sustaining programs, and their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22, which you can see in our um, audited financial statements, are $1.4 billion. Okay. Global Campus, we have talked a lot about Global Campus in the last few years, uh, and it, it, you know that it was established in 2020 to expand access to higher education for adult learners and non-traditional students consistent with our land-grant mission. We have four U of A employees who serve on the UAGC board. Uh, we have a trademark and license agreement with the UAGC for our marks. Uh, we joined as a party to the Temporary Provisional Program Participation Agreement, or TPPA, with the Department of Education. <laughs> uh, they provided us an initial fee of $20 million in fiscal year 21, and their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22 were $112.5 million. You are all well aware that we are just 29 days away from integrating UAGC into the U of A. So this will be my first and last uh, presentation on UAGC as a component unit. You'll hear more about them in the budget when we talk in a few weeks, Regent Herbold. Right. Uh, the Law College Association was established in 1968 to support uh, and provide financial assistance to the College of Law. The Dean is on the LCA board and our U of A business officers provide some administrative support services to LCA. They in turn reimburse us for that administrative service and they provide scholarships and operational support for the College of Law. The scale of this relationship is limited just to the College of Law and their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22 were $15.7 million. Campus Research Corporation is uh, another entity that we've talked a lot about in uh, these meetings, especially when we talk about leases related to CRC. They were established in 1994 to benefit U of A and local research initiatives to help create community connections and to operate our tech parks. We have U of A employees, four of whom are on the CRC board, and the vice president of Tech Parks, the, the lead for Tech Parks is actually one of our employees, as well as her administrative staff are U of A employees. Uh, we are tenants in their buildings. You've heard us talk about the refinery. Uh, we, we lease the space from CRC. We, um, CRC employees also have an opportunity to participate in the QTR program, like the foundation, and we serve a broker or care and carrier type role for their property insurance. Uh, so they pay the premiums and we would file claims on their behalf if they have them. 
We also provide a review and approval of all lease term sheets um, for CRC and some de minimis office space for their employees when they're working on campus. Um, they provide management of the tech parks and economic development and community engagement for the greater Tucson community. Their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22 were 42.8 uh, $42 million. Uh, Eller Executive Education, or Triple E, was established in 2012 mm -hmm. to provide uh, executive education that's non credit and non degree education for uh, government, uh, business, and nonprofit leaders. President Robbins appoints all of the Triple E board members and can remove any member at will. Uh, our U of A business officers provide administrative services to Triple E, and our U of A, some of our U of A employees serve on their board. The Triple E lead is a U of A employee. They um, give us, or we also provide faculty support. They teach, our faculty members teach their courses. We give them some office and event space as needed. They also have a trademark and license agreement for U of A marks. Uh, they repay us for administrative services that we provide, and they provide financial contributions to the Eller College of Management and any other college that partners with Triple E. Uh, they also offer faculty and staff development through their course offerings, and their uh, total assets in fiscal year 22 were $1.1 million. So all of the, uh, the five entities that we've discussed so far are listed in our annual comprehensive financial report. Um, the next two that we're going to discuss uh, have not been included because they, uh, they were not material. However, the Applied Research Corporation, we anticipate, has hit materiality and will be included in the fiscal 23 uh, annual comprehensive financial report. So University of Global Operations, not to be confused with UAGC, this is UAGO, <laughs> was established in 2019 to support global operations through planning, implementing, and carrying out university, uh, universities' international activities. They exist solely for our benefit, and uh, President Robbins also appoints all of their board members and can remove um, any member at will. Uh, all of the UAGO board members are U of A employees, and those members approve the budget and the strategic plan for UAGO. Uh, we pay for the global services that they provide, uh, we provide them some business services and IT services, uh, some office space. They have a trademark and license agreement. Uh, they provide international recruitment for us, which is critical uh, to our financial sustainability. And they provide research planning and implementation of global operations in specific countries that we're targeting. Their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22 are $1.7 million. And then the Applied Research Corporation uh, was established in 2018 to further educational research and development uh, objectives in the area of applied multidisciplinary research. Uh, President Robbins and the provost appoint all uh, UAARC board members and can remove any member at will. Uh, UAARC <coughs> assists us with obtaining classified research contracts in areas such as topics, <laughs> hypersonics, cybersecurity, information security, and space-related research. Um, U of A employees serve on the Applied Research Corporation board, and we pay uh, UAARC for research and technical services such as research opportunity identification, um, bid and proposal assistance, and proposal management. We provide them some business services and IT support, and their employees are also uh, have the ability to participate in the QTR program. They have a trademark and license agreement. Uh, they reimburse us when we provide them personnel, materials, or facilities, and their total assets at the end of fiscal year 22 were $2.7 million. That was lightning round. I'll stop there and ask if you have any questions. Hearing none, um, we'll now move to NAU. And Bjorn Flugstad will join us. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Regent Herbal, members of the committee. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Associate Vice President Becky McGaw, who is our uh, leads our contracting, purchasing, and risk management uh, team, uh, and she her team is very much involved in a lot of the agreements in setting up uh, the agreements uh, with uh, our 
two uh, component units. Uh, our two component units are pretty straightforward, uh, pretty typical uh, as a, a university would have. Uh, our foundation uh, established in 1959, uh, so very similar, but one year later than U of A, uh, as well as our Northern Arizona Capital Facilities uh, Commission, NACFFC, uh, which has been uh, used uh, for financing uh, since 2001 for four projects. So I'm going to let Becky give a few uh, comments related to our foundation. Thank you, Regent Herbold, members of the committee. The RNAU Foundation uh, provides services to NAU uh, for management and admi administration of donor contributions, financial stewardship and investment of endowment funds, fundraising, donor development, um, NAU provides space to the organization that they actually pay NAU for, and we have a, they have development officers embedded in um, many of our departments. Our last agreement was reviewed with them in July of 22, and there are two subsidiaries um, under the NAU Foundation, the Northern Arizona Real Estate Holdings, NAREH, and they um, conduct real estate transactions on behalf of NAU and the NAU Ventures LLC is for business development and IP startup kind of work that they do for NAU. Um, the foundation has its own board. It's completely independent from NAU and exists solely for the purpose of supporting NAU. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bjorn to talk a little bit about NAC FFC. NEC FFC uh, has been used four times for four uh, separate capital projects uh, on the NAU campus, uh, starting uh, in 2005-06 with McCabe uh, Village uh, and Pine Ridge uh, dormitories, uh, continuing uh, through uh, the student uh, the uh, student and academic services building, and more so recently within our student athlete high performance center uh, that uh, issues uh, lease revenue bonds uh, rather than system revenue revenue bonds. And uh, the total projects uh, of all four projects have been approximately 130 million uh, over those uh, uh, four projects. So with that, uh, we will stop and uh, answer any questions. Seeing none, uh, we will thank you, by the way, and uh, we will move to ASU and Morgan Olson will provide the overview. Here, Herbold, members of the committee, uh, we prepared just two slides to sort of provide uh, an overview of a fairly complex uh, structure that we have for the university's affiliates, including component units. This first slide should be relatively familiar to the committee in that it shows uh, the university with its three uh, enterprises that uh, have mission-driven purposes, academic, learning, and knowledge enterprises, and there are a lot of support units that are Below that in the uh, in the graphic there, some of those are some of the component units that we're talking about. Others of them are uh, actually parts of the university support units, but they all provide a, a foundation for helping the university to achieve its mission. If you advance to the second slide there, maybe I haven't got uh, it yet. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is another look at the same uh, type of information. Uh, this is really breaking down the uh, 11 different uh, affiliate entities that we have uh, as defined under the board policy. And you can see that uh, there are some that are known as discrete component units. Very exciting. That's accountant speak uh, for uh, entities that are accounted for separately. So if you go out and look at our financial statements that you all received a copy of, uh, it will show the financials for those uh, uh, affiliates individually and separate from the university legal entity financials, which are also provided separately. And then we have something that are, is called blended component units. And in contrast, what that means is that those entities that are gold on the chart here, uh, their financials are just blended into what you see in the university's financial statements. And uh, maybe stepping you know, back on this uh, just a bit, uh, the uh, uh, board, as you know, redid its policy uh, on affiliated entities and defined a term of component unit affiliates. And those are all legally separate entities with their own governance structures 
that are affiliated by virtue of our written agreement with Arizona State University, in our case, or the other two uh, Arizona public universities in their cases. And they also have to be component units under governmental accounting standards board uh, uh, policies. And so that's kind of the definition of that component unit affiliate. But uh, basically, all of them are tools for helping the university achieve its mission, kind of special purpose tools. And um, the policy basically is intended to govern the university's uh, uh, management or, or relationship uh, of the uh, affiliated entities. And so uh, there are a variety of things in that policy that we're required to do to ensure that we're managing that uh, appropriately under the policy. Um, the uh, entities all have their own governance structures. Uh, many of them have staffs, not all, but, <clears throat> but many of them. Uh, and uh, our uh, structure, uh, there are a lot of subsidiaries under some of these entities. So for example, ASU Enterprise Partners, you can kind of see in the the maroon box kind of in the middle of that chart actually has six subsidiaries and they in some cases have their own subsidiaries for example one of our one of our entities that's part of enterprise partners is university realty and that special purpose tools uh skill or or the reason that it exists is to assist the university with certain types of real estate attractions or or, or real estate uh projects rather that either the university cannot or chooses not to do directly. Uh, oftentimes those are around generating, you know, resources that ultimately flow up to support the university's mission. And every time one of those uh, uh, real estate projects is done, there's a separate LLC that that particular project sits in that rolls up to university realty, which in turn rolls up to enterprise partners. So that's, that's just one example of that principle. Um, we have the ASU Foundation, of course, very similar to what you heard from the other two universities that is our fundraising arm that raises private gifts to support the universities and their activities, and then manages those uh, resources. Sometimes those are gifts that are passed almost immediately through to the university for expenditure. But in other cases, uh, those resources are invested long term and are intended to provide revenue stream in perpetuity to support the university, often known as an endowment. Uh, so other other entities that are under EP are, are uh, ASU Research Enterprise or Assure that uh, performs at the uh, request of the university specific research projects. For example, it might be defense related research that we want to separate from the university to manage risk and, and other considerations. We have something called Enterprise uh, Collaboratory, Skysong Innovations, which uh, has a special purpose of uh, managing the intellectual property that's generated by our faculty's activities. We license that intellectual property. In some cases, we may uh, sell it. We may uh, develop a company, a startup, you know, that uses that intellectual property. And so they manage those processes on behalf of the university. Uh, they can take equity interests uh, in uh, enterprises, which is one of the special powers that that entity has on behalf of the university. And then we have something called ASU EP Holdings that uh, is intended uh, to uh, hold the uh, enterprise partners interest in uh, special entities, companies that have been established. You've heard us talk about things like uh, Sintana uh, that you know helps uh, support and instride our, our mission uh, broadly defined for uh, expanding teaching and learning uh, across the population. And so they have a role to play there. So each one of these things has a purpose that's set up and, you know, just uh, summarizing them in order to keep this short, you know, maybe fundraising and, uh, and donor development in the case of ASU Foundation. It can be friend raising in the case of the ASU Alumni Association. Uh, support of the university's research operations, which grow increasingly complex with each passing year, technology transfer and intellectual property manage, as I mentioned, that uh, Skysong Innovations does, uh, some of our work in the area of real estate investment, uh, similarly, student housing or energy production financing, uh, that is uh, our Arizona Capital Facilities Finance Corporation. So more of a legacy, we're not using that particularly. There have been some changes in accounting uh, standards uh, and credit rating uh, standards that make it less useful to us, but it has a lot of assets that it manages like Sun Devil Energy, like our Hacienda housing complex on the uh, Tempe campus. 
And then uh, finally, we have a, a number of international and global impact projects that uh, uh, ASUEP Holdings helps us with. And so uh, I, I mentioned just in summary, uh, there's a great deal of research on each one of those entities that uh, I think can give the board and the committee background on uh, the scale from a financial standpoint and the mission of, of each of these entities. But in total, as of June 30, 2022, all of these affiliated entities had uh, net assets of just under $1.6 billion. That was sort of the, the net assets value at June 30 of 2022. And the fiscal year 2022 revenue for those entities was about $518 million. Uh, I'll mention also that uh, you know you've seen us reporting at an enterprise level, as uh, President Crow has encouraged us to do, so that we're looking at the totality of ASU proper and all of our affiliated entities that I've been talking about uh, here as a total. So in excess of uh, five billion dollars of uh, revenue this year, and we just think that that provides sort of the best view of uh, the total economic uh, activity of the ASU enterprise. So uh, I'll mention just a little bit about uh, uh, the management that, that Brad was talking about and the oversight here. Uh, we actually have a checklist that has about 10 or 11 items on it that we look at each and every year for each of these affiliates. Uh, Anjali Halbe is saying over the right, you might just wave your, your hand there, is actually the university officer who part of her responsibilities is to maintain oversight of all of these affiliated entities and the university's relationship with them. There's a lot of complexity that goes into that. And so that's something- fact, Morgan, might you just introduce her as a new vice president? Uh, yeah, we did at a previous meeting, we did, okay. but uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, Anjali is the vice president for financial services, deputy university treasurer, came to us from West Virginia University, replaced Joanne Wamsley. Um, let's see, what else What else can I cover here? As I said, they each have their own individual governing structure. Uh, there's a separation of powers between the university and, and each of these entities. Uh, we do assessments of risks of, uh, around that relationship. I know we'll be talking about that uh, more uh, in a minute, but let me just stop there and ask if there are any questions that the committee has. Larry. Oh, thank you, Regent Herbold. I'm only looking forward to Morgan, and I probably should have asked this of the other two as well, just where you're headed with overall processes for risk mitigation. Yeah, and and I believe we're going to talk about that a little okay. bit uh, in the second session. I appreciate that. Happy yeah. to comment on that. Very good. Other questions for Morgan? Hearing none, thank you very much for the report. Um, thank you. These items that we've just covered with the three CFOs do not require any action on our part today. So we're now going to move to item number three, which is a discussion of ASU's request to expand the fashion and design program in Los Angeles. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll ask uh, uh, Dean Tepper from the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts and Provost Gonzalez to join the table with Dr. Olson. Uh, let me use this opportunity just as a reminder to the regions that these are periodic updates on our Los Angeles strategy that we've spent years talking about. And the Los Angeles strategy for Arizona State University is to uh, be present in what we consider to be the one of the two global cities in um, uh, the United States, New York City being the other, uh, in a way in which we can continue to enhance and build this institution. Uh, we're not in California to help build California. We're in California to help ASU build ASU and help Arizona to be, to be built through the proximate relationships that we can build. I'll just remind the regents that the industrial interactions and the industrial overlaps between California and Arizona are unbelievable in scale, in uh, technology areas, in uh, military uh, technology areas, in uh, 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 healthcare areas, in a range of areas, the overlaps are very, very substantial. And we see this in everything that we do, including a project that uh, you all will become more aware of even in this meeting, which uh, with a California partner who's going to be investing substantial resources into our macro technology works here, as it relates to the microelectronics uh, initiatives that we have and the semiconductor initiatives that we have. In the case of Los Angeles, uh, we run the largest uh, uh, design and arts uh, college in the United States in the Herberger Institute. We run the largest uh, journalism school in the United States in the Cronkite School. Both of those colleges at ASU 
we believe can be uh, national schools operating in multiple locations, not every location, but multiple locations. We've already made progress in the California Center uh, on Broadway. So California Center Broadway, the facility, the old Herald Examiner building that the regents are well familiar with. <clears throat> and we're making progress in that facility as it relates to expanding journalism, uh, expanding the Thunderbird School of Global Management, which is a third school that we believe can that can operate in Washington, Phoenix, and Los Angeles uh, with master's programs and specialty programs, all of which enhance our reach educationally, enhance the experience for our students, and enhance, to be blunt, our revenue in terms of uh, advancing ASU. This particular area that uh, this item, uh, the, the FIDM item, is related to is the expansion of of our connection in those industries that are highly creative. You've already heard and been subject to our briefings associated with the emergent uh, uh, Sydney Poitier New American Film School, which is now up and running and operating in both locations. We've had a number of maneuvers that required board uh, approval along the way. Uh, we're now uh, looking to expand our fashion, fashion design, and other design-related programs. And as the regents will recall, in our previous conversations, we've talked about how we could do that uh, through a maneuver that we're right in the middle of. We're going to spend some time in executive session talking about the financial aspects of that maneuver. This session is intended to focus on the academic aspects of that of this maneuver. And so, what we're working to do is to find a way. And you've got to you've got to stay with me on this. You got to stay with me on this. Uh, we're not in this particular region, Phoenix, as connected to the creative industries and the markets of the creative industries, as is Los Angeles. And we're looking to find a way to build that bridge between both the experience of our students, the outcomes of our students, and then the ultimately the, uh, the connection of the two regions. Now, regents will, re will recall, because you've approved at least five steps of the process associated with the new facility in downtown Mesa, which is a world-class facility called Mix which is a multimedia, unbelievable facility on a world scale, which is empowering our journalism school, empowering our art, media, and engineering program, empowering other aspects that we have associated with the Herberger Institute. And so today is now the next step in that process, which is the step by which we're designing and evolving a creativity hub for Arizona State University, which operates in Phoenix and Los Angeles. And that's basically what we're talking about doing. So I'm going to turn quickly to uh, Dr. Gonzalez to set this up relative to where we're going academically. And then uh, I'd like Stephen Tepper to uh, walk through our Dean of the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts to walk through this notion of this hub. So Nancy. Yeah, let me just- any, any, First, any questions for me about where we are? Because I know that there's different committee interactions, different ways the regents have been engaged in our last, our Los Angeles activities are now in their uh, 11th year. So we're 11 years into this process, and this is just the next step and the next step and the next step. And the purpose is to build a capability connecting ASU to Los Angeles for the benefit of ASU, our students, in every possible way. So yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Regents. Um, and to that point, I'll say that when we first announced that we were that our plans uh, with respect to uh, FITM and it made and it was announced in the media, the most excited group hearing about this were our students back here at ASU. In the fashion program. In the fashion program here at ASU, because they understood immediately how this uh, affiliation or connection to FITM would uh, impact them and benefit them in terms of impact, in terms of the connections that FITM brings with fashion brands, with fashion, with fashion industry, with other creative industries, and would really propel them into the future, regardless of where their career in fashion might take them, including back here at Arizona. And the first questions they were asking is, when can we go to LA and visit? And when can we interact in that facility downtown uh, in, in downtown uh, Los Angeles? So so it really is our effort to uh, advance fashion uh, and related uh, uh, activities for all of our students, particularly and including those here in ASU. Let, let me let me just make one comment, contextualizing things just a little bit. So in the last 14 days, I've been at universities in Cairo, in Egypt, uh, two of them, a new university that we're a partner of called Galala University in New Cairo. I've been at Abu Dhabi University and then two universities in Dubai. And what was interesting about those universities in Cairo, this emerging effort to get this economy going, I met with some students there and at in Galala University who were 
design students in, I saw the most unbelievably creative artificially intelligent enhancements of art and expression in the concept of design. This is, this is an area that, that old geezers like me have to get used to, get some understanding of where all of this fashion design was going. So I'm sitting in Cairo, Egypt, listening to design students talking about fashion designs that are being enhanced from European art using artificial intelligence systems to derive their designs from. And I'm just like, the world is changing very, very rapidly. We went from there to have breakfast at the pyramids. And so. <laughs> so uh, academic, academically speaking, the plan that we're advancing to you today will expand ASU's existing fashion program so that it will now be in two locations, downtown Phoenix and downtown Los Angeles. As part of that expansion, the ASU fashion program has been named ASU FITM, integrating the name, the legacy, and the campus associated with the LA location of the Fashion Institute for Design and Merchandising. So students wishing to study fashion at the LA location will now enroll in what are already existing fashion degrees and, and, and design degrees um, um, at ASU, just as our current students do here in Phoenix and Tempe. Those wishing to study in LA will do so as immersion students at our ASU California Grand location. And as our- I'll just comment. So California Broadway is one of the buildings. California Grand is the new building. So that's the reason for the use of the word grand. It's just the streets that they have. Yeah, yeah. Broadway versus Grand. So, so as our work uh, and our interactions with Venom Advance, uh, we anticipate there will be additional degrees um, and, and a new school structure. And we will be bringing those forward to you as we do with all of our other degrees and units. And we're looking for to have you busy reviewing a lot of things in the fall. Um, this is a very exciting time for fashion at ASU. Our ultimate goal is to become the leading fashion school in the nation. It's also a, a, a really important part of the vision for the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. Um, and, and Stephen Tepper, the Dean of, of Haida of uh, the college will be talking more about that, but it's really bringing in, in much of the way that we talked earlier today about health, bringing uh, some of ASU's advances in terms of intellectual fusion and technology to bear in really advancing these industries in new and innovative ways. Um, and Stephen has been uh, the Dean of this college for coming up on a decade and and the vision has continued to expand in an incredibly exciting way. So I'm gonna let him- I'll, I'll just say that, that we, we hired Stephen from Vanderbilt University 10 years ago. Um, he's unusual, his PhD from Princeton is in, in a sense, the sociology and the, of the arts, the, the complex understanding of the arts and their impact on our society. And so Stephen's assignment was exactly to do what we're trying to do here, which is to build a national uh, institute for design and the arts that can be competitive with the other handful of such entities around the country, but in the spirit of ASU in a larger scale and in a more uh, accessible uh, set of ways. And so this is a process that helps us to do that. I'll also just suggest to the regents that it's not yet been fully recognized the economic development power of the universities. We're connecting with industries that aren't presently here that will be here. We're connecting in ways there'll be overlaps back and forth. This is already proven to be true in engineering spaces and so forth and so on. We think this will also be true in these spaces and that it will be conducive to the success of both regions. Great. Thank you. Um, so arts and design education is among the most exclusive. Uh, there are no great arts and design colleges that are open and accessible to all. And that's what it means to, to build a national arts and design college that's a new model. Um, so we want our students to have access to the best, the best faculty, the best facilities, the best technologies, the best locations to, to learn and to get internships and to work. Um, so over the last uh, eight years, the college has doubled in size uh, of 4,000 new students. Almost all of those students are in the creative industries. So that's animation and that's film and that's fashion and that's popular music. Um, these are the areas that our young people want to go into. Uh, they're already doing these things at home, in their bedrooms, on their phones, and they want to find a rigorous pathway to keep learning and to keep creating and to, and to, to work. And to make money. And to make money. And it turns out that these are uh, among the fastest growing sectors of the global economy. People predict that uh, the creative economy will be about 10% of global economy by 2030. The wages in these industries are going up at higher rates than other sectors. So these are good jobs, and these are the jobs our students want. 
And Arizona is about 15 years behind in terms of its ability to have uh, a really robust creative sector. We're, we're going to get there. Um, the new tax credit for film is going to help. Um, but in the meantime, we've got thousands and thousands of students. And as all of you know, the creative industries is a, a sector that requires you to know people, to be deeply embedded, uh, to be well networked. Um, and to be connected to industry. And, uh, and so our students, it's our responsibility to give them those opportunities in Los Angeles, which is the global creative capital of the world. Um, it represents 10% uh, of the global creative economy, even though Los Angeles County only represents 1% of the global, a less, little less than 1% of the global economy. So uh, that's where you have to be. Um, and so what we've done is create the concept of a creative economy hub, um, uh, and these industries are changing fast. And one of the things we want to do is be a national leader for our students so they can be successful. One is the industries are no longer siloed. Um, fashion works with film, with work, works with music. Uh, films are involving animation. Um, our students want to be connected together. Most of the great fashion isn't only clothing. Fashion is, clo is clothing, it's textile, it's design, it's, uh, it's spaces, uh, interiors. Um, and so we're trying to create a, a, a hub where students can connect and collaborate across all these creative disciplines because that's how the sectors are working. We want to create a hub that really embraces new technologies. ASU can take all of its great power in research uh, and advancement in technology and apply them to the creative industries in the way other, uh, other colleges have not been able to do historically. And we can, of course, give our students access to global relationships and connections uh, the, the the creative economy is global and students need access Who's to in that the picture and where's the picture that picture is in the uh now california center uh broadway and this is a virtual production studio um and this is how many films are being made now so the mandalorian is a great example where that camera um tracks with uh three three walls and a ceiling and a floor um so you can shoot an entire film on set without having to go back into uh, full post-production as a, those are students. Extraordinary. Those are students. They're not actors. <laughs> not, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, we have an acting program also, but all the world is. And just to, you know, um, a, a third of our students are first generation, the majority are non-white and the fact that they have access to these spaces and these technologies is uh, is un unbelievable, um, including the Media and Immersive Experience Center in Mesa that President Crowe mentioned. Um, this is just our conceptualization of how it fits together. Uh, again, it's it's an umbrella unit. Another strange ASU design. <laughs> um, but related to ASU FIT, I mean, important for us is to have the right kind of brand partners in Los Angeles. Poitier itself is a brand. Um, but but FITM is also a brand with 75,000 alumni that our students now have access to. So for us to build the credibility in the creative industry so that our students have the greatest chances of success, we need a model that allows us to work with industry throughout LA and in Arizona across many facilities. Um, also building research labs to support the creative industries. No other art design school has strong research connected to the future of those industries. We want to lead there. Um, and then these are the buildings that we are operating out of. Uh, we have Fusion on First, where our fashion and popular music program is based, again, with the best technologies possible. First Street in Phoenix, just to orient you. We're not back in the upper left is Phoenix. So the best recording studio in Arizona. Um, the Mix Center, the Media and Immersive Experience Center, we traveled across the world to see what the best uh, facilities were. And we built um, one that rivals all of them in Mesa, um, in Mesa Arizona, in partnership with the city there. Uh, ASU California Center has our virtual production stage, and it houses our uh, narrative and emerging media program. Um, and then at California Center Grand is the uh, historic um, FITM building, which has a lot of, um, for people in LA, it is, uh, it is a signature space uh, known for being creative, uh, a great place to host events and to attract industry. And then our design school there at the bottom is uh, just a representation of our Tempe campus. And our 
vision is that students can move sort of frictionlessly between these spaces because each of the spaces have different kinds of technologies, different kinds of opportunities. And so just imagine if you're an Arizona student and now you have the chance to spend uh, your final year in LA, your first year in LA, you could spend a semester in LA, you could spend a week, you could do a boot camp, you can go to a career fair. If you're in LA, you can come and work in our specialized uh, facilities here in Arizona. Um, this idea of a hub that allows students to move between these facilities and these technologies and these faculty is something that no one's ever done before. And we think it will allow us to lead nationally in powerful ways. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, ASU FITM again is building on this legacy of a FITM is more than a 50 year institution. It's a FITM picture. Uh, that is a FITM picture. And that uh, uh, there's, I think that vest will fit them well. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can we strike that from the public record? Um, uh, so ASU FITM has this great uh, reputation, um, but it's also not in New York, which is a good thing because New York fashion schools and the fashion industry are really based in Europe. They look, um, they look to the East. They try to replicate those designs. They're very exclusive. They're very elitist. LA is a very different kind of fashion world. It is diverse. It is inclusive. It is interested in new materials. A lot of manufacturing happens in California and LA. It doesn't get shipped off to other places. It's the kind of place where we can really advance innovation in, in exciting ways. Um, and there's also no fashion program in the country that's connected uh, the way this will be to a global research university. So, so much of fashion is about material science, it's about technology, it's about artificial intelligence. Um, our students will have access to the best research, um, will really position them ahead of their peers. Describe our, our parallel school in art, media, and engineering. So long ago, the regents approved our school for art, media, and engineering. These are engineers and computer scientists who are also artists, or artists who are also engineers or computer scientists embedded in this school. So just talk about that as one of the Herberger schools in the context of ASU FITM. Sure. So, um, you know, arts, media, engineering are, are filled with uh, students who are uh, computer scientists, engineers, interested in robotics, doing game design, doing um, uh, building objects. Uh, and it's the only school of its kind that has combined all these things into, into one. And as I said before- but it's in Herberger, it's not in engineering. But it's in partnership with engineering, but it's right. within our within our college. Um, so those students are very nimble, very flexible, brilliant students. Um, and again, the ability to go and work in LA, where the best uh, gaming companies are, the best uh, animation companies are. Um, there's a lot of world building, as all of you know, the metaverse, whatever we call that, is all about building creative worlds for people to spend time in. Those worlds have to look good. They have to sound good. They have stories, they have architecture. Um, so we need these interdisciplinary schools like arts, media, engineering uh, to build the assets and the experiences uh, in the metaverse. Um, so again, LA is where uh, the industry is. And we believe that our students can gain extraordinary experiences. And many of them will come back to Arizona to start their own businesses and to work in the creative industries here. You know, one thing that we learned, I think, with the acquisition of uh, Thunderbird was the importance of bringing along the prior graduates of Thunderbird. And this took a long time. And Larry was uh, intimately involved in the transfer. Uh, but if you say there was any mistake made, uh, you wouldn't call it a mistake, but I think we lagged a bit once we made the move over to ASU in bringing along those uh, alumni. And so I would urge you to jump on that right away because these people you want them to be your salespeople. you you want them to be your uh your uh, uh real supporters uh, uh and it's vitally important uh, president crow if you were to meet a legislator in the elevator and uh which one an arizona <laughs> <laughs> lord knows what would happen but one question, what happens if the legislator says, why in the world are you building this thing in Arizona or in California? You'll yeah, I mean, so the, the answer would be uh, with those legislators and others is that it allows us to advance 
the interests of Arizona State University and the educational experiences of our students. And so it's no different than a uh, oceanography student who's taking a semester abroad or a year abroad on a ship. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's no different than people doing field work and field experiences. It's just in this case, it requires a more comprehensive immersion into things. So let's say, let's just take the film school itself, the Sydney Poitier Film School. So Phoenix and Arizona are not known as a as a as a center mass uh, uh, place for the film school. Our film school will be infinitely more successful because it's now operating in Phoenix and Los Angeles with all of the connections that go on. So all the kids from Arizona that want to be uh, uh, trained up or learn in those environments will now have access to the best of the best of the best. And so it's about helping our students to be more successful. And it's also about helping Arizona to expand its economy through the relationships that we yeah. can build. We can already see that happening with the Mix Center. So there's things happening in Mesa and around Mesa with the, with the movie industry and the film industry and the documentary industry and so forth and so on that couldn't have happened without that facility. So we're very excited about that. The state legislature and the previous administration uh, got the uh, film uh, tax credit uh, through the system. And that is a powerful tool that we have to move forward. So we're both laying the seeds for future talent and we're laying the seeds for future industry. Yep. Other questions? Agent yeah. Herbal, real quick, um, to all of you, estimates on increasing, call it the, uh, the, the student population. What are some of those year one, year two, year three projections of this becoming uh, 500 students, 1,000 students. Are there any projections so far on where this fit them, uh, fits into increasing the enrollment with ASU and specifically inside the Herberger School? We have projections for ASU fit them, uh, the, the immersion location, and, and we're, we're expecting about 150 students enrolling in, in ASU fit them located in in uh, Los Angeles this fall. We project out five years, we see that growing to 1,600 to about 2,000. And then the film school and other things would be, and journalism and other things would be right. in addition to that. So thank, you. thank you, Chair Herbert. Um, have you obtained the appraisal? Yes. Yet? Yes. We're going to talk about that in the uh, oh, okay. executive yeah. session. And, um, and you said that um, this is going to be fun at the at the local level, right? The uh, the building, the fund. You know how are you going to pay for that? Right. Yeah, we'll we'll be covering all That's that. That's what we're going to uh, cover okay. in the exact okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'll just say to Regent Mata's, um, you know, general, we'll deal, we'll deal with the details because okay. the transaction is still in motion, so we have to deal with that. Okay. You know, in Thank executive you. session, but as in all the things we do, including what we talked about relative to the med uh, medical school. We're schemers. And so as schemers, we find partners, we find opportunities, we find ways for other people to pay for things. Uh, we find we find ways to, to become involved with a project where the project's uh, investment on our part is uh, uh, <laughs> smaller than it might be. And so these are things that we've already worked this out and you'll see the, you'll see yeah. the details. Thank you. So watch out for President Crow. Yeah, Schemer. I Pick your wallet. <laughs> Thank you. You want all your university okay. presidents. Yeah. 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 Building yeah. crane managers. <laughs> okay, any other comments, questions? Okay, question. Oh, we do have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, from the uh, Regent, Regent. Regent. Oh, Regent. Student Regent. Student Regent. Student Regent. Sorry, uh, Regent Herbold, I didn't put the label on my name. Um, I had a question after reading uh, through the provided materials. It says that uh, ASU does not acquire FITM as an educational institution and that they can continue to operate independently and they're focusing on uh, academic programs more related to business. I was curious if there's a worry about them becoming competition, um, if they're still allowed to work in that market. Well, I'll, I'll make a, a region, I'll make a, a, a quick response to that and then uh, Dr. Tepper can, uh, can comment. It's the separation of their business programs that means there won't be any competition. And we're happy with that separation and are partnering with the ultimate partner of the new entity itself. So the 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 old FITM is going away and there's two entities coming out of this. Uh, this is not an acquisition of the school. This is different than that. This is us uh, uh, advancing our own school using the historical legacy and the connections that we have. I think that's an accurate portrayal. Uh, but there's there's no there's no competition. They're not they're not that school is not going to go back into the fashion uh, design uh, uh, business. 
yeah, nothing really more to add to that. They they will the second entity will focus on uh, they have an MBA. They focus on uh, undergraduate business, not just in fashion, but more broadly uh, in creative industries and beyond. So uh, we think they'll be synergistic. We'll um, partner with them in some yeah, way. Yeah, we right. Very good. Thank you. Well, we have more time for this topic uh, in executive session. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll now move across the hall to the executive session to discuss uh, any legal advice, uh, some of the finances, et cetera. Once the engineer or the executive session is over, we'll reconvene here for uh, uh, the remainder of the public session. Uh, so do I have a motion to uh, convene into executive session now? So, so moved. All in, or do I have second? second. Yeah. Do I, all in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstentions? Very good. We'll go across the hall. Uh, our committee here and uh, the first order of business is back to uh, Morgan. Back to Morgan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, uh, I'll uh, attempt to conclude this uh, item uh, quickly since there has already been a good bit of discussion on it before the break. So what you have in front of you here is uh, a request to authorize purchase of a building uh, in downtown Los Angeles, about 172,000 square feet and about 270 parking spaces underneath that building. Uh, that uh, uh, building uh, would be used in the ways that our academic leadership shared earlier. I won't go into that any further. Uh, uh, the building itself is located about uh, four and a half blocks from our existing uh, building in downtown Los Angeles, and importantly, very close proximity to the LA Fashion District. Uh, the uh, property was built in uh, 1990 uh, for academic purposes, and uh, we think will work uh, very well not only to support the expansion of our fashion programs to downtown Los Angeles, but also for other uh, Los Angeles-based purposes that we uh, already have established. So uh, I would share with the uh, committee that uh, there are two appraisals that support the uh, purchase price that we negotiate that we have negotiated, uh, and I'm I'm going to. Uh, 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 not mention that price yet because we don't have in our hot little hands a, a signed purchase and sale agreement, uh, but uh, we did share that, of course, with the committee in executive session. So it would be for that amount uh, plus appropriate closing costs. Uh, we would hope to uh, close uh, by er no later than early July. Uh, those those appraisals do support the, the price that we've negotiated. Uh, it also includes uh, the right to use the adjacent Grand Hope Park. This, it's a the building uh, itself is a little bit over a quarter of a block in downtown LA. Uh, there also are some maintenance assessments that go with that that we've built into our uh, overall financial projections. Uh, the uh, uh, plan would be to use existing ASU funds to cover the uh, capital cost upfront, and then amortize those costs over a roughly a, a twenty year period. And uh, we have a pro forma that includes. Uh, paying for the amortization of that cost uh, from tuition revenues that will be generated by the operation of our programs there. So uh, I will stop, and if there are questions, I'd be happy to address them. Any questions? So hearing none, I will move that the committee forward to the full board for approval the Arizona State University request to purchase real property located at 919 South Grand Avenue, Los Angeles, California, from the FIDM Realty LLC, as described in the executive summary. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstains? Nope. Thank you. <clears throat> We've skipped items four and five, and they're going to be celebrated at our board meeting uh, up in Flagstaff appropriately. Yeah, good. I was just saying um, for item number six, ASU uh, requests uh, the committee to review a ground lease. So, I, uh, Morgan, I'll let you again take it from here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, uh, this item, uh, as you said, would uh, authorize the university to execute a, a ground lease with American campus communities is a uh, company that uh, is involved in the development of uh, student living and learning facilities across the U.S. Uh, they have been our partner on uh, uh, eight 
uh, previous uh, uh, student living and learning facility transactions. And in fact, we have uh, another one underway right now that the board approved uh, several months ago on our uh, West Campus. So this would uh, be the uh, 10th if you uh, see fit to authorize this. And Morgan, what's the rough value of all of those 10 together? It's uh, oh gosh, uh, market value today, or or well, just what 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 it would like. be uh, somewhere between a billion and a half and two billion dollars. <laughs> Another source of capital that we found in fancy institutions. Great. Yeah, over over eight thousand uh, uh, beds and and uh, you know affiliated uh, learning and dining spaces with those facilities. And this one will be similar. Uh, we we anticipate that uh, we'll accommodate about eight hundred twenty eight. Mm -hmm. uh, student beds here with this project as as well as some uh, dining hall space and academic space. It would be located uh, on the southeast corner of University and Mill. Uh, you're familiar with uh, our, our previous discussions about uh, the Omni Hotel uh, and Mirabella. So directly south of there on the remaining uh, parcels there that are going to be almost completely transformed by, by the time we're done here uh, is where we would locate this uh, residence hall and, and dining facility. Immediately to the west of that, uh, we have a parking structure and the wrap building under construction. If you go over there, you can get a pretty good sense for what it's all going to look like. So uh, it will go from being a very strange open uh, corner and uh, the you know, now second urban center in Arizona to being uh, a mixed use, pretty exciting development that will uh, serve the university in some pretty important ways. So uh, the reason that we're doing this is we're not currently able to uh, meet the demand for on-campus housing for our students. About 70% of our first-year students uh, choose to live on campus. Uh, we were about 4% uh, short in terms of capacity of being able to meet that goal this fall. And with the increasing cost of uh, housing uh, off campus, we're also hearing from a lot of uh, other students, uh, upper division undergraduate students, graduate students, even postdocs that, you know, gosh, does the university have space for me? Because I'd, I'd like that option to you know, to uh, live with the university if possible. So we anticipate that uh, by the time uh, we would open this, which would be fall of 2025, that we'll need roughly an additional 1,100 bets. And so I guess I'm sort of suggesting to you that I will be likely be back talking to you again soon about additional housing, but this will at least provide about uh, 800 uh, beds toward that need that we have. Uh, we have about... Uh, 13,000 uh, beds on the Tempe campus and about uh, 16,800 beds overall of on-campus living on our four campuses in the Valley today, just for context. This will be a residential college for our Herberger Institute of Design and the arts students. It's located in a, in a good place there. We're very uh, close to uh, 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 Gamage Auditorium, the music school, our N Nelson Fine Arts Center, Stauffer Community Arts, and of course the design school. And so we think this is a really good place to uh, to locate it. The total cost of the project, we think, will be about $140 million. Uh, uh, ACC would uh, design and uh, construct to our specifications the facilities I've described to you. We would reimburse ACC for the cost of constructing the dining and academic space that would be integrated uh, within the facility. That's about $25 million. And uh, so let me just stop there and ask if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, do you have a question? I do have one. Has Mirabella been uh, socialized in this conversation? They, has the, Are have they the aware? Absolutely. They're all aware. Yes. Right yeah, is it? Oh, yeah. we, we've already we've already resolved the most complicated issues, <laughs> okay. and uh, and the subject of noise that, yeah. that that's been repaired. Okay. So uh, we several of us uh, actually have some frequent correspondence yeah. that say, yeah. So what about this site to the east? What about this site to the south, et cetera? So <laughs> Omni is also open. Yeah. Oh, now, we've 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 learned uh, we've learned that probably is good to read them in when we can. So <laughs> yes, very good. Any remaining questions? So I move that the committee forward to the full board for approval, Arizona State University request to enter into a ground lease for approximately 1.73 acres, a real property located at South Myrtle Avenue near the intersection of East 10th Street and ASU Tempe campus with American Campus Communities or affiliates for the development of a new third party student housing dining facility, academic space, and the right to lease all or a portion of the facility 
at an annual cost of $1 million as described in the executive summary. So do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstains? Or I should say, any opposition? <laughs> any abstentions? Good, it passes. Guess what? You're, <laughs> You're stuck. Morgan again. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, did you want to introduce the next item, Mr. Chairman, or should I just- Yeah, it's the it? construction of the Interdisciplinary Science and Technology Building. Uh, so you can describe. And, and there it is on the screen. If you would mind advancing uh, one slide there, we've got a couple of uh, depictions of this building uh, that uh, is uh, about $187 million project. Uh, it's going to now be known as our ISTB-12, Interdisciplinary Science and Technology Building. Uh, let, me get, let me remind the regents of the logic for such names. <laughs> we do not prefer to name buildings for academic departments or schools because then they become a part of a conscious control mechanism. And so we prefer these broader names, interdisciplinary science and technology building number X, Y, Z, until we can find a name that might be reflective of the purpose of the building with a donor or another uh, sort of uh, designed name associated with that. And that's, that's why we have Biodesign A, Biodesign B, really thoughtful names, Biodesign C, we're planning Biodesign D. Uh, and so <clears throat> that's the reason for these kinds of names, although the, the, this will be the home of this School for Advanced Manufacturing and Network Engineering, which is the seventh of the Grand Challenge schools of the Fulton Schools of Engineering. So, so as President Crow said, this will this will be the uh, home for that uh, new seventh engineering school focused around manufacturing systems and networks. It'd be a roughly 180,000 square foot facility. It's going to have a lot of instructional space. It will have obviously office and support space. Uh, and then research labs and collaboration space. We, you know, we, we hope to collaborate uh, with industry around several themes, and so all of that will be accommodated in this building that's going to uh, sit at the uh, southwest corner of Innovation Way, which is the loop road that runs around the core uh, of the campus on our Polytechnic campus. Uh, on the screen, this is a view from uh, from the east, the entrance of that facility. If you'd advance to the next slide. Uh, similarly, here's uh, here's a view from the southeast that that's Innovation Way that runs along the the bottom of the uh, the slide here. Uh, it will be uh, complementary in in terms of its appearance to the uh, buildings that are out there. There's some fairly unique out architecture on our Polytechnic campus, and uh, we think this will be in keeping with that. Uh, it's going to support the needs of about uh, 50 faculty members ultimately uh, in the Manufacturing Systems Network School and about 3,000 students. Some of this space will be university classrooms as well, so it will benefit students beyond the, uh, the engineering school as well, but it's going to focus on things like additive manufacturing, cyber manufacturing, robotics for manufacturing, uh, smart manufacturing and industry automation, semiconductor manufacturing. And so we're very excited about this project uh, that we hope to get going in uh, September. Uh, it'll take about two years to build. And so we think it'll be ready for fall 2025 classes. Uh, uh, in terms of how the building will be financed, $187 million uh, will debt finance about $104 million of it with speed bonds. Uh, some of the board members will remember uh, the speed initiative that's getting a little bit long in the tooth now, but uh, we have that much uh, speed authorization remaining. Uh, I really like speed bonds because 80%, up to 80% of the debt service uh, is paid by lot, state lottery revenues, which means that uh, we're essentially only paying 20 cents on the dollar as long as lottery revenues uh, uh, hold up. So, you know, bet hardy, please. Uh, uh, we're also going to be uh, uh, financing uh, uh, $52 million of the project with system revenue bonds on which we pay 100% uh, of uh, debt service. And then we have $31 million that's remaining from the uh, appropriation for fiscal year 2023, one-time capital appropriation. Both NAU and ASU were uh, uh, privileged to receive that uh, appropriation. And uh, of our dollars, we're going to spend $31 million in you know cash uh, uh, for this building. Um, the debt ratio impacts fairly modest, about 0.15%. If you exclude the speed bonds, if you include them, about 0.21%. And of course, uh, we'll be paying debt service uh, generally, uh, the part that, that we're uh, responsible for from uh, uh, tuition, and that's built into our long-range financial planning. So, so let me let me add one one comment relative to this meeting, this building, to, for contextualization. So, 
Arizona is now uniquely positioned to greatly expand its manufacturing sectors. You can see this happening now, the $5 billion plant by Samsung for battery technology, the $40 billion plant by uh, TSMC for uh, digital uh, components, the expansion of Intel, the hundred supply companies that will come with TSMC, the uh, electric vehicle assembly of Rivian, of Lucid, of other groups that are here, the expansion of other advanced uh, technologies in water and solar, all of which have manufacturing components. So you can even see in Arizona's economic profile that manufacturing is now ticked up to about 10% of the economy, give or take, and that's accelerating. And so this is our attempt to get in front of that and lay down the, the, the position for producing the most advanced manufacturing engineers that the world can produce in the most advanced facility that we can build at the moment that manufacturing has swung our way. So uh, the region should be aware, you, you might've seen it in your email exchanges that we also won recently a $70 million project for advanced electricity-based heavy metal manufacturing. That is the manufacturing of metal alloys without carbon inputs. That changes everything for Arizona because you're not gonna make heavy uh, metal alloys with carbon inputs in Arizona. You're gonna make them in Pennsylvania where the anthracite is located, or you're going to make them in some place where the carbon sources are much closer to you. You don't need the carbon sources. You produce the electricity here, solar. You build the heavy metal, uh, uh, not heavy metals as in chemical heavy metals, but heavy metals as in complicated alloys. You can make all of that here. So there's an opportunity in a renewable energy sense with advanced manufacturing technology for Arizona to accelerate into the manufacturing world. And this is our one of our contributions to that process. And so this school has been moving on an accelerated basis. We're moving as fast as we can. Uh, Provost, I think she's still here. Uh, we've hired the school director. We're hiring the faculty. We're bringing in people from the top programs around the country. We're seed funding through uh, knowledge enterprise research initiatives. Uh, and this is a very, very important thing. And then I'll add one last point. This is also the gateway to the undeveloped innovation corridor at the uh, Polytechnic campus. So we've positioned this building just slightly off the main set of buildings so that it can be a gateway into what we hope will be uh, a manufacturing oriented, advanced manufacturing oriented, advanced materials oriented uh, innovation park there at uh, our Polytechnic campus. And that's how many acres? About 300 acres. About 300 acres. Yeah, so we have a huge, these are, these are sites that are unparalleled in the country. People don't have these kinds of things. And so these are you know, we we were blessed to get this base. You know, when the base closure commission came into place, we figured out how to utilize it, and this is our next big step. And so we're trying to stay always, you know, two laps ahead in the in the long marathon race here of where we should be as a university in terms of producing these people that this school will produce, and in terms of producing the new research that this school will produce. And this building is essential for us to be able to do that. And the financing is fantastic with these speed bonds. I mean. It's just really fantastic that we have another secret source that had been sitting there fallow that we've been able to use. Questions? Seeing none, I will move that the committee forward to the full board for individual project and financing approval uh, for the Arizona State University request for its interdisciplinary science and technology building number 12, as described in the executive summary. The approximately 180,000 square feet, uh, $187 million uh, capital project will be debt financed with speed revenue bonds totaling $103.6 million, system revenue bonds totaling $52.4 million, and the balance of $31 million funded by one-time state appropriation. The balance of the annual um, debt service will be paid over approximately 30 year term and funded by tuition. Uh, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved, we are finished with that item. Mr. And Mr. We Chairman, if I might add just relative quickly to that particular item, uh, you know, it also is the case that that's the building shell. So then equipping the building and staffing the building with people, that's where the new economy initiative comes in, which has been uh, somewhat problematic in, in transitions between administrations in terms of understanding its purpose and so forth. So, so this, this you know just under $200 million building doesn't include the hiring of the 50 faculty members and the equipment that they need, which will be tens no. of millions of dollars more. 
along the way. Those are one-offs, one case at a time going forward. But I just wanted to link this back to the new economy initiative also as an important uh, aspect of all of these things. So Great. Yeah. Okay, for item number eight, ASU will request committee review to begin construction of its Tempe District Utility Plant. Morgan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for putting up with me for one more item here. Uh, this is a small building that uh, we're going to uh, wedge onto the same site that I was talking about earlier, uh, south of Mirabella uh, and, and the Omni, uh, because Alex told me we have to. Uh, this, that area has been uh, largely a parking lot for about the last four decades, and all of a sudden uh, it has a uh, hotel conference center, a lifelong learning center, a big residence hall and dining facility, academic space, and a uh, parking structure. With an office complex wrapping the parking. Structure. Correct, uh, which, which means that uh, we have to expand our uh, district utility system for chilled water, uh, electricity, and, and heated water. And as it turns out, because of the growth in downtown Tempe, there's a lot of uh, you know additional demand for electricity there. And so we're building about a 20,000 square foot uh, uh, district utility plant to do those things. We're going to do it in kind of an interesting way because of its location where we're going to make it possible for students to see a lot of the works, if you will. And I think a lot of our, our students, particularly uh, you know, engineering and construction management students will be interested in seeing that. Uh, uh, so uh, be three stories uh, and uh, it's uh, an expensive facility because of the nature of it, it's uh, about uh, $52.2 million. We're gonna debt finance that with system revenue bonds amortized over a 30 year time period. The debt service will be paid by tuition uh, over that time period, the impact on our debt ratio is about 0 0.07. So relatively modest, but uh, this essentially is, uh, you know, some of the plumbing, you know, that's necessary to support all of the programmatic uses sure. that we've talked about. So uh, if there are questions, I'd be happy to address them. Any questions? Okay, I move that the committee forward to the full board for individual project and financing approval. The Arizona State University request of its Tempe District Utility Plant, as described in the executive summary. The approximately 20,000 square feet, 52.165 million major capital project will be debt financed with system revenue bonds. The annual debt service will be paid over an approximately 30 year term and funded by tuition. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's approved. Yeah. Item number nine, Arizona University, the University of Arizona, requests committee review of the request to sell property adjacent to the I-10 frontage road. Uh, Lisa will walk us through this. Regent Herbold, as you said, this is a 14-foot parcel in northwest of Tucson, just off of I-10. It's the current location of an AZPM AM transmitter. Uh, this transmitter is no longer able to meet our demands, and we've never been able to transmit uh, at night from this location. The space is not conducive to upgrading, um, but it is attractive to commercial developers. It's very close to the Tucson Premium Outlets Mall and uh, retail subdivisions. So our plan is to get FCC approval, which uh, FCC has indicated that this will be straightforward. Uh, then we would sell this land via auction, use the proceeds to support the AZPM upgrades and move those AM operations to the Rita Road Tech Park. Uh, we would not be on the north side where we have our research and commercial operations. We'd be on the south side of I-10, uh, which is not ideal for those operations and already houses another transmitter. It's half the distance from AZPM, so it'd be much easier to maintain the, uh, the transmitter and we'd be able to operate at night. I'll stop there and ask if you have any questions. Questions for Lisa? Hearing none, I move that the committee forward to the full board for approval, the University of Arizona request to sell at public auction its 14.52 acre parcel of real property 
located at 9100 North I-10 Frontage Road in Marana, Arizona, as long as the property is not sold for less than the lowest appraised value as required by board policy uh, and also described in the executive summary. Uh, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Lisa. Item number 10 is a review of the board's office request to amend Arizona University system voluntary plan, section 403B of plan. Uh, Chris Okazaki, roughly speaking, is that anywhere close? <laughs> Okazaki. Okay. okay. <laughs> Chris, we'll call you Chris O. That's fine. Chris o. Go ahead. Thank you. As you know, the 403B is a voluntary plan that we offer to university employees allowable under the Internal Revenue Code. When we adopted the plan, we did not elect to adopt an involuntary cash out distribution threshold for terminated employees. This is the ability to automatically roll over money in the plan for terminated participants whose account balance is below a specific amount. The amendment adopts a threshold of $5,000 and raises that amount at, after December 31st, 2023 to $7,000. The first, This is the first amendment to the plan and it'll be effective July 1. And in the executive summary on page four, it incorrectly states that it's effective August 1st, 2023 and will be updated before going to the board. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Hearing none, I move that the committee forward to the full board for approval, the First Amendment to the Arizona University System Voluntary Section 403B plan as described in the executive summary. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Next item 11 is a review of the board's office request to amend Arizona State University optional retirement plan. Chris, that you have this one as well. Similarly to what we just covered for the 403B plan, we are proposing a third amendment to the optional retirement plan to do the same thing with the same dollar thresholds at the same dates. This is the third amendment to the ORP, ORP plan and will also be effective July 1. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Chris? So I move that the committee forward to the full board for approval, the third amendment to the Arizona University System Optional Retirement Plan as described in the executive summary. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you. That concludes the uh, Finance, Capital, and Resource Committee meeting. Thank you for participating. Any work, Mr. Chairman? We actually have about 